Did you want to host? Yeah, if they'd asked me, I'd have taken that job in a fucking heartbeat. Probably you, wouldn't even count it. Do you? <laughs> it wouldn't have even counted. Whatever the number is, fine. I absolutely would have. If you are as a black American man offered an opportunity to spit real shit in prime time in the country of the United States, whether you want the job or not, you, that's a deployment, bro. That's like, it's <laughs> a calling. Like, I, you can't I, say no to that. I know there's no dis- But I wasn't bitching about like I wasn't mad about it I understand why Hassan was the pick I yeah. get I, I understand it, it was Hassan Mas- that's Minaj. what the street said that it, Hassan was the front runner and then so the that's fine or whatever but if you're if I'm asking you if you're saying Hassan and at that point they entered the strike Hassan wasn't the front runner anymore okay cool what's the plan uh we're still figuring it out and I respect that this is a tough thing you got to get right the to a ratio. Okay, though. The to a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You's a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. My man, Roy Wood Jr. is one of the greatest and most important comedians of today. He just left The Daily Show. We're going to talk about quitting. We're going to talk about the possibility of hosting The Daily Show, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and what it's like parenting his son in a very intentional way now that he's into the co-parenting chapter of being a father. Epic conversation with a brilliant comedian. I love this. Let's get into it. It's the man, the myth, the legend, Roy Wood Jr. on Touré Show. Roy, yeah. how are you? How you been? How are you? I'm good. I have no complaints. Um, it was a good year. We had a, it was a strike, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the people on strike who's able to still go and do other things yeah. and make money, thankfully, yeah. and keep the lights on. So I toured. I toured all year. And the we tour did. was helping you build your next special. Yeah. You well, got, at you least got the next all, hour. You got all the jokes you need. I, I, but here's the thing. I wasn't even building with a special in mind this time. Okay. But now that I have it all, it's like, hmm, I think this is a special. <laughs> I think these jokes are good enough to put on TV forever. We did 40 cities, 40, 50 cities in the States. And then we went to Canada for about almost 20 cities, I think, 17, 18. Okay. We were in Canada the whole month of November. So, you know, we're just kind of wrapping up this year. And then next year, January, like, I'm going to do some stuff with Jordan Klepper. I got that Love Tribulations him. Therapy Show thing I'm going to do. Next year, I'm going to play it a little more. I'm going to downshift a little bit from stand-up and use that time in New York to do stand-up. Like, the thing I did different this year is that, like, my first three specials, just for context, my first three specials I would build in 15-minute increments in New York City comedy clubs. So you're going up at, like, the Comedy Cellar. Correct. Doing a short bit. Six, six sets in a night. New jokes. Ten minutes every set. So by the end of the night, I've run that 10-minute chunk six times. I know down to the semicolon what works and what doesn't. Put that 10 minutes to the side, bring in a new 10 minutes next week, build that. T- and so that's the wash, rinse, repeat of how I traditionally would build a set. Would you would you go home and listen to it? Yeah. And take it apart? This worked, that didn't change this, add yeah. to that? Yeah. Like, for me, I'm one of those comedians where I can listen to my audio or watch. Like, comedians watch other comedians and critique. For sure. It's instinctive. A lot of times— I wouldn't have done that. I would have said that. Yeah, a lot of times you'll do your set at the cellar or whatever, and then you'll be at the booth, and other people are like, you should have tagged this with this. Yeah. You should change this to that. And you write that down, and then you walk that shit on stage 30 minutes later. Yeah. And then you have an answer immediately, which is—and this is part of why New York comedy— is the proper gem to build yourself as a stand-up. Los Angeles is more to do so many other things with your career. But if you just want to be in the comedy gym and get your reps in, there is a stage for you in this city. What was different for me this time, eight years into New York City, was because because I saw the strike. Like in February, I figured, all right, in case this strike hits, A, 
book let's do some comedy this year. Let's just book let's book some cities. Normally I'm touring on the hour I've built in New York. Mm-hmm. I, I was not actively building an hour before I went out on tour. So so the tour became the place to build some of that material, much in the same 10-minute increments that I was doing here in New York. Only now I'm doing it on the road. So it changed how the jokes developed to me for the better. And so now, top of next year, first four or five months, I'm going to take what I did on the road and file it down here in New York. So, you know, normally you would build 10 minutes in New York City and then you would take that out on the road and expand that 10 to 15 based on how people respond. But now I have 15, 20-minute chunks that I need to trim to eight or nine. Okay, this joke about self-checkout and how automation has created social distance from one another, let's trim that down. I think I have one too many examples in that. Mm. So let's work that down bit by bit by bit. Like that's a joke where without doing the joke, the basic thesis is that the more auto, the more automated we are, the less we talk to one another. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. how customer service was a forced social interaction <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that for the positive of humanity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have self-checkout, you have um, pharmacy, Walgreens, whatever, everything like that. You have the elimination of full, ster- full service gas stations, the automation of porn, which means you no mm-hmm. longer go to a porn store, mm-hmm. which as awkward as it is. Got to talk to somebody. Which, and the people who are in the basement watching porn, they need to be in conversation <laughs> with people to make sure you don't go murder. <laughs> then you also have examples like the airports now are making you bag your own bags, tag your own bags mm-hmm. when you check in your bag. You so, can check in without ever talking to somebody. And that's not normal. That's behaviorally. We, we are talking to each other less than ever, you're saying. Correct, because of technology, mm-hmm. which is supposed to be this great connector. Mm. But in a way, it's a social divider. So how many technological examples do I need of this technological divide? I've already overwritten the joke, and it works fine on the road. So now I will come to New York City, and I'll do a run with just gas station, porn shop, self-checkout. Then the next set will be Walgreens, airport, self-check-in, gas station, like change the order, change the topics, change the examples, which ones work the best, which ones feed, which ones ride the momentum of the previous example. Like that's this, for me, that's what I like, the science of jokes that I like getting into. So that's what I'm excited about for next year. So while I'm doing that, to still be able to tour, doing something totally different from this existing hour, I'm still going to do regular stand updates, but the bulk of my... Touring next year will be with Jordan Klepper or it will be the Tribulations comedy therapy hybrid thing that I did. So wait, it, when you're doing, when you're going through this process, is the audience the sole judge if, it, if they laugh or they laugh a certain way, then we're rocking? Yeah. Or are you the judge when like, well, that audience didn't crush on that, but I know this is going to work. How many times can you do it before it doesn't work? A joke is no different than... It's like athletics. You put a you put a player out there. You love him. He's a great player, but he fumbled. He scored a touchdown. He threw the ball into the stands. He missed the shot. <laughs> if he doesn't put up twenty points and ten rebounds, he got to go. I or ten and ten. Just give me a chuckle. I'll find somewhere else in my act to put you. It is hilarious to me the thesis statement that I am shocked that anybody black over seventy voted for Joe Biden. He has pet German shepherds. You would think <laughs> you would think any black person over 70 would not fuck with any white person who has a German shepherd. Just off the PTSD. Yes. Yes. It never gets a laugh. It's fine in conversation, mm-hmm. but that thesis statement on stage never does what I need it to do to establish the next run. Mm-hmm. So... That joke, as much as you love it, is is creating drag, and you have to streamline. 
so it has to go. That's a tweet now. So now you can take that joke and retrofit it for some other, hey, you don't work on stage, but there's still a place for you within our organization. <laughs> you you like that joke, but he's not scoring points. My job is to get on stage and score points. Now, if it's something that's really funny to me that I hold near and dear, okay, fine. But for me, that joke is too long of a walk to too little of a payoff versus— you don't care about the jokes. You care about the laughs. Well, I I want people, if you're not laughing, then I don't get an opportunity to slip in any little quick quip or knowledge or whatever little vitamin I may want to sneak in. Like there's a, there's a joke that I'm working on now for the new hour about being invited to a sex island. Mm-hmm. I have a couple of porn stars invited me to a sex island. And then I pause and I say, don't worry, this one's for adults. (laughs) Because I don't want you to think I was invited to that sex. And I never say Epstein. I just say that because you can think it or not. I don't need to say it. Like, to me, that's too much spoon feeding. We know when you say that island, we already know. And if you don't, it's so small of a digression that you're still laughing at the fact that I got invited to a sex island. You're intrigued now. Yeah. So that line about it was an adult sex island, that's for me. That makes me laugh. I don't care if you laugh at it or not. There was a line in my first special where I talked about Rocky, Rocky IV. Apollo Creed, yeah. Rocky IV is a sad movie because Rocky lost his only black friend that day. Apollo Creed died. It was a sad day. Michael B. Jordan lost his father. And I just wait like a two Mississippi count. And then I continue with the rest of the bit. And the people who make the connection to Creed, Michael B. Jordan playing Apollo Creed's son, to Apollo Creed Carl Weathers, good for you. You get a little extra laugh just then. But if anyone else didn't get it, you just didn't get it. And I'm not going to stop to explain it. It just made me laugh. But it's quick. Yeah. And then I'm right back on task. Yeah. I don't want to do – there's some comedians that are good at it, but I'm not good at combat comedy like that. What does that mean? Where you're going to go with me on this premise. You may not like it right now, but you're going to go with me on this, and by the end of it, you're going to love me. I don't have that persona. I don't have that ability – um, Patrice O'Neill did it really well. Bill Burr does combat comedy very well. All of his bits are not combative, but it's a bit where he has deliberately pitted himself against the room on this thesis statement and will stand ten toes down in that thesis and deliver it all the way. And by the end, love him or hate him, you know how he feels about something. And to me, that's different than just doing a joke just for the sake of shock and making the audience go, hmm. Mm. You know, like when Burr did his SNL monologue about white women and how white women are getting in everybody's business and, you know, just went in on white women on a white show in front of a crowd full of white women. But he delivered. They left. He delivered. <laughs> you know, but in the early goings of those bits, it's very much, you know, he's juggling dynamite. Mm. So... That's a different skill set that I don't I don't possess. Some guys have said to me they like to do something early in the set to put themselves in a hole, to like make the audience dislike them, to see if they can dig themselves out. Yes. To insult the town or something or the local sports team or something. Yeah. You don't do that. Not really. You want to be liked. I want to be heard. And the simplest way to you hearing me is to get you to smile. So for me, that's kind of, that's the easier path. Because you can dig a hole, you can shit on the town, but then you need the charisma and the believability to get yourself out of that hole. You know, and that's, Paul Mooney does a good job of, mm. of that to a degree. Genius. Um, you know, 
rest in peace to him. But, you know, Paul Mooney was definitely a person that would come on stage off the jump and tell you what the fuck is real and not, and don't care what you think, how you feel about it. And more often than not, most people in the room were along for the ride with Paul, but there would always be somebody in the room uncomfortable, especially white people. Yeah, yeah. And he would see you uncomfortable yeah. and lay into you more. <laughs> yes. Oh, you shifted in your seat? Oh, you don't like that? And just would, I would saw, go in. I saw Paul at Caroline's once, and I was with a light-skinned girl, Ooh. and we Ooh. were with friends of ours, a black guy and a white woman. They were together. And let's go see Paul. It was probably my idea because I love Paul. And they I, I, the they sat us in the front. Come on, like we could touch the stage. I'm like, yo, we are in the splash zone. We are going to, you know, we were with an interracial couple and we're going to get murdered. One of the most radical comedy shows. <laughs> <laughs> You know, every time I see a large number of American flags, I think of you and your joke about, you know, <laughs> well, if there's one, it's cool. But if there's too many, we get to feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, how many flags, how many American flags equal one Confederate flag? Right, 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 right. <laughs> there's a number. I don't know what that number is. Right. But there is a number. One is cool, five, six. I'm like, okay, you're talking about something different than I'm talking about. See, and that's the type of joke where I built that joke in New York City, but then had to take it on the road to mm -hmm. make sure it works. Mm. And like every other special, this one will be the same where the week before I go up to tape, I always perform in Atlanta and Peoria, Illinois. Mm. To me, those two cities are the perfect slices of what my what I would like for my comedy to touch. I need to make sure that black culture rocks with this, especially Southern black culture, because they're going to tell you the truth about whether or not what you're talking about isn't fair or justified from a the vitamins. Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to stress test your, your theories. Mm -hmm. And then middle America is like, okay, how much of this do I need to change? Because I don't want to change a bunch of verbiage to make this point. But can a middle class at that median income, some below the poverty line, white and black people in middle America, there's nothing more middle America than the home of John Deere tractors. <laughs> the club in Peoria is across from a dirt track and next door to a strip club. But I the, love this thing, this counterbalance you get. <clears throat> the New York audience could be rarefied. They could be having their own shit. So I'm going to go over here, too. So you have your sp Atlanta gets you in the middle of black culture. And, you and know, black accountability. Mm -hmm. And the middle, and then Peoria, kind of like the middle of the country, kind of intellectually, whatever, yeah. class and all those sort of things. So then you're like, yeah, like I took it to, but then this one. Atlanta, Atlanta gives me what exactly are you trying to say? about us and, our, and the black experience. And then Peoria is, let's see how they take this shit to the chin. Let's yeah. see how well they, Atlanta teach you how to throw the punch. Peoria is where you see how well they can take the punch. So then, I love that. So then what does New York do for you? New York is, you know, more punching techniques and style, like just blocking, like, okay, I need to account for this type of group. Not Like, like Brooklyn is where I go early on as well, because I need to know what the white gasps are going to be. <laughs> when white people gasp at a joke, I need to know where in this bit a regular granola eating for breakfast, you know, not to stereotype, but they be, they be eating granola. <laughs> where are they going to be? <gasps> Ooh. Yeah and then decide how much I want to tweak that to either make your gasp more, to yo-yo you back into a place of agreeing with me, or just smooth the bit out a little bit right there. Because some people, if they gasp, now you're not going to pay attention to anything else I'm saying after that. Right. And I don't want to lose you right? because that's not my style. I can't do, I can't combat, I can't, say something and you disagree and then I make you disagree even more and more and more and then I take your point of view and flip it at the very end. That's not my fighting style. So I need to know 
what every demo, and that's what New York does. New York, this entire city is a series of focus groups, mm. but you cannot get them all together with the exception of maybe um, Comedy Cellar, Gotham Comedy Club, and I'd say Stand Up New York are probably the best mix of just all genres of people and cultures and all of that. But you go uptown, you know, it's black people, it's black and brown people who they got to work in the morning. Mm. They laugh differently. They connect differently with material. Whereas if you go out in Brooklyn, and you, like I remember one night we were performing at some brewery or something like, it's always some weird ski shop or some odd shit. Like it's kombucha <laughs> plant. Like, it, it, And the type of people who come to that see and process things a little differently. Um, the the one thing that I that I definitely like that I don't care about is when people have empathy for me. You don't care. I don't like that because you're not. We have we have become so sympathetic to everybody's cause and everything that everyone is going through that somehow audiences think that they have the authority to decide when a comedian can make fun of themselves. Mm. I open I open for I open for someone. Um I'm not gonna say the comedian, but it, it, it was this comedian's audience is very warm and loving because that comedian makes them feel good. And that, and it probably was a bad booking. I probably shouldn't have taken the, the gig, but they want to feel good because they want to be happy. So they want you to be happy. So they want to know that you're happy. So if you get on stage and talk shit about yourself, they go, oh, and I don't like that. That's worse than a boo because now you're rejecting, you're, you're, you're in a way you're taking my power away from me to be able to make fun of myself, to use that as a lead in into something else. I'm on stage, I'm doing comedy. Clearly I'm dealing with the feelings because I'm fucking talking about them. So you have to know where those points in your act are as well mm. so you can decide how to season for taste or just not care. I just like to know. I need to be aware of where those potholes are. And New York gives you that, that more specific of a skill set. So that's what I mean if we're using fighting as an analogy. You go to Brooklyn and learn your footwork. You go to Harlem to learn your blocking. Mm. You go into the city to learn how to get in close and fight close versus fighting at a distance. Harlem is tempo, faster, louder. Brooklyn is pacing, slower, softer. How does this joke work if I say it fast? How does it work if I say it low, if I change my octaves? Like, what are the different things that I can do to adjust it? And then based on everywhere I've performed in all those boroughs, what is the most universal way to tell this joke? Because I don't feel like changing this shit up every night. Right. And I'm not going to. Right. So that's the stuff when it's time to, like, really drill down and screw, screw down. That's the stuff I'm looking at. And it's too hard to do that six sets a night and be on the road every weekend doing the full hour. Also, you know, my son is seven now. So, you know, I could work crazy. You know, I did three hour specials in five years when I first got to Daily Show. So in that run, well, six, three, three and six years. So in that run, for the most part, my son wasn't old enough to miss me. Mm. And I missed him. For sure. But it's different when they miss you. Oh, my God. And they can call you and reach you and FaceTime you. And then it's like, oh, shit, okay. Well, the and, shit that fucks you up. So I don't want to tour as much. When they're little, if you walked in the door, they'd be like, Daddy. But you call them, and they're like, I'm not interested in talking to you on the phone. Just a face. Well, You're we can FaceTime. Face. I'm like, this is FaceTime is not interesting to me. Can we play? No, then I'm yeah. done. I'm like, oh my god, I can't even connect. Yeah, but we got we got the little chess. There's this chess company that has an app, so we play chess. Nice. That's the that's the key. And then he'll whoop me, and then he'll FaceTime me to talk trash. I used to play chess with my boy, 
and then he got way too good for me. <laughs> I can't even touch him. It don't make sense. He's good. He's good. Either he's good or I'm distracted. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. So wait, let's talk about, I want to talk about just the idea of, of quitting a job in general. Because <laughs> I was trying to think back through my career. And I'm like, have I ever quit a job? I don't think I ever said, no, I'm good. Y'all want me to stay? I'm good. I'm leaving. Because <laughs> I'm never sure. Am I going to get another job? Is this I'm the not end? sure. Is this where I start to become homeless? I look back on I shouldn't have left. Oh, I still think that that, that feeling does not go away. That feeling <laughs> remains. But that paranoia is what propels you I went creatively. To my high school... One of my high school reunions, and one of the guys said, oh, I'm between jobs. And I'm like, that is a white person comment. <laughs> you are certain there will be another. As a black person, I'm like, I could never stop between, because that means I know something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm between, but there's something. No, I, shit, you got me thinking. Golden Corral in Tallahassee, <laughs> I technically never quit. Right. Miss Darlene said, because what happened, summer of 2000, summer of 2000, I started working the road heavy in the summer. I, I still had a year of college left. And I kept calling off shifts because I kept picking up road dates. And then eventually Miss Darlene said, we're just going to move you to on call so you can pick up shifts when you want. When you're nice. ready for me to add you back to the schedule, let me know, and we'll add you back to the schedule. Is that door still open? And that was summer of 2000. I still have my name tag and apron. <laughs> you could, you could, but you're not going to do that. I'm not bullshitting you. I still have, and the paranoia, 26 years solid in entertainment, I cannot throw away that apron and that <laughs> fucking name tag because I just don't, you never know. You never know, but you know. I might have but to go you, back. But you, you quit this awesome job at The Daily Show. Okay. You don't see it that way. No. I, it is an awesome job, mm. but you have to look at what do you want for yourself next. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, what it was. And if it's not... If it's not for you or if it's not serving... If you start looking at the greater landscape of your career... Then you have to ask yourself, is my time best spent in this place now? Fuck what the job means to everybody else who doesn't have the job. Mm. Fuck what the job meant to you when you got the job. Mm. What are you today? And does that serve everything else you're trying to do? And I sat and I thought and I thought and I thought and I thought. And the answer was no. Was there a tipping I think, point? I think the strike was probably the first time we just hadn't worked the job in a while. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think that was probably part of it. Like if if you remove the strike from the equation, then you're just constantly there and working. So you just don't have time to sit and settle and just go, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I don't think I need to go back over there. So this the strike gave you time to think about what am I doing next and come to this decision. Well, because I also knew during the strike, or at least I felt during the strike, that it wasn't going to be me to host. So is, is that the center part of this? Like, I I have been here. I am big enough to do that. If you let me host, I'll rock with you. If you're not going to go that direction, cool, I'm going to go do something else. It wasn't so much that you didn't pick me to host as much as it was, well, if I'm not the host, then who is, what is the, you know, what are we, what are we ultimately going to be doing? Because I have to ask myself the question of, if there's a new host that's not me. Do, do I fit in his world or, or her do, world? Do they want me in their world? Right. I may not fit with their offense and their. There you go. I'm a wide receiver. This new host want to run the ball. Well, then I got to go be on a team that want to pass the ball. So, or go somewhere else and be a quarterback. So the idea of waiting for that question to be answered Can't is what it. I did not have time for. Can't do it. 
it wasn't so much about, well, we don't know if it's going to be you or like, come back, guest host. Okay. Like everybody's guest hosting. So I'm sure I would have gotten an opportunity to guest host, but what is this leading toward? Because that is not an easy job. Everyone says dream job. Yeah. But it is a time consuming. And I say that with respect to the job, which is part of why. Yeah, I should leave because if my mind is split on thinking about, all right, well, there is potentially a world at the end of at the top of the year where I am not a part of this program and it won't be my choice. So let me take time now to think about what life without this program would be and start assessing that. And you cannot do that fairly for yourself to feed your family and build your career while also properly doing the job of correspondent. You cannot, there's not enough time during the day, especially when you add a kid and you're still touring. I had to go to Canada for it. I'm still wrapping up 50 cities during all this time. The show is going to come back and I'm still on the road. Yeah. So now I got a double dip. So when is the moments of stillness to get the creativity you need mm. to go, oh, here's a segment I want to do, or here's a show I'd rather do. Here's something I would rather sell now. You stay with the show, you get pushed out the door, whether you like it or not. Now it's January. Now you got to ideate. And now you're ideating against an industry where the strike is over with, and it's a fucking mad dash where everybody's trying to get their show sold at a time when they're cutting shows. Like, if you look at it from my side, right? All right, we don't know if we want you to host, but we like you, and you like us, and it's been a good situation. But anything could happen in January. Whether you like it or not, anything could happen, including you no longer being a part of this program. So if you, Teray, are trying to figure out what to do next, and you need to start thinking about that, because in January you might not have a job. Right. It's possible. Right. It ain't guaranteed, but it's possible. You should consider it. This is the first time in eight years where you know might not be back, motherfucker. So would you start thinking about those ideas now so that when January comes, you're ready to go with all of your ideas nice, neat, and ready to go? Or would you wait until January to be kicked out the door? It's like being asked if you'd like to pack your parachute <laughs> now or after you or jump when out we, the plane. Or when we kick you out the plane. So I had to pack my parachute, man. Did you want to host? Yeah, if they'd asked me, I'd have taken that job in a fucking heartbeat. Probably I, wouldn't even count it. Do you? <laughs> I wouldn't even count it. Whatever the number is, fine. I absolutely would have. If you are as a black American man offered an opportunity to spit real shit in prime time in the country of the United States, whether you want the job or not, you, that's a deployment, bro. That's like... <laughs> So calling, like I, you can't I, say no to that. I know there's no dis- But I wasn't bitching about like I wasn't mad about it. I understand why Hassan was the pick. Yeah. I get I, I understand. It, it was Hassan Mas- That's Minaj. what the street said. That Hassan was the front runner. And then so the New York or whatever. But if I'm if I'm asking you, if you're saying Hassan and at that point the end of the strike, Hassan wasn't the front runner anymore. Okay, cool. What's the plan? Uh we're still figuring it out. And I respect that. This is a tough thing you got to get right. But I cannot bet. I can't wait. I cannot bet 2024 against this process. I have to leave. At that point, this dream job is something that potentially could keep you from thinking and ideating what your next dream position will be. Because all these jobs are temporary. None of these all shits of is forever. So oh. you, you should already be thinking about what that next gear shift is. There's no deserve in this business. Mm -hmm. But do you not deserve that shot? Deserve got nothing to do with it. (laughs) I'm sorry, I keep thinking about the wire. Um, (laughs) I deserve a shot, but then make your own shot. And that was my whole thing about media now is that waiting on someone to give you the at bat. You could. They might still call. Okay. Or in the meantime, let me figure out another way to do the things that I want to do. But I'm not going to be angry or upset 
I am fucking thankful that I got to work there yeah. for eight years. Ain't a lot of jobs that stable. It is one of the be- next to Saturday Night Live. Daily Show is probably one of the best jobs in comedy in terms of just learning and stability, just employment stability, you know. So I, the idea that it was my turn, there's a lot of people who thought it was their turn when they chose Trevor. Sure. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know where that goes, but I've thankfully been fired enough from numerous jobs and Mm -hmm. I've had my guts ripped out on national television on various reality comedy competition programs Mm -hmm. that I understand that loss is part of gain. So I'm not mad about it. I'm not upset about it. It's literally, it's literally figuring out what's next for me. And if y'all figure out what's next for y'all and it includes me, let's have a conversation. But in the meantime, I cannot bet next year on waiting to see this process play out. Mm. Mm. And that's all it was. I still might go to the Christmas party. <laughs> it was, might crash the Christmas party. You know? I mean, like, you are, you don't need the Daily Show to be you, to be, to rock. You don't, you don't need it. It was a great help at the beginning of the road, but now you are your own entity. Yeah, but now I have to figure out what that is and build that for myself. Yeah. And so that's what I'm working on. And, you know, there's still scripted shows and other things you can do. But if we're talking about things that mirror what I'm best known for over the last eight years, I can self-ideate that. And I think that's the bigger conversation about late night that— Sooner or later, we're going to have to have a reckoning about it as an industry. Once the strike settles and they figure out all the scripted stuff, they're going to turn their attention to the non-scripted and figure out where we need to be saving money or where we need to be making trims. So the idea that someone on TikTok can post their opinions politically and post facts and get a couple chuckles in the process— can get as many views as any other piece of media from any other professional outlet that says a lot about what audiences care about. And I think audiences just care about truth and information. I don't think they necessarily care about how polished something looks. So it's there's op, there's going to be open opportunity as budgets, as they cut budgets for late night, then at some point, You cutting the budgets becomes neck and neck with what the self-produced people are doing. Mm. And if the audience doesn't really care, now it's real democracy Mm. in terms of where I go to get my political satirical content. What is the dream project? Is it a sitcom? Is is it somehow you're doing a news commentary show of your own somewhere else? The only thing I know for sure— right now is that I enjoy talking to strangers about all bevies of issues. So I know like that's the, again, food is an, we use food as an analogy. I know I want pasta. So that's the pasta. Talking to strangers. It's talking to strangers. About politics. Or anything. Ideas. I, I just talking to strangers. Now you're getting into ravioli versus lasagna versus okay. penne. All but I know is pasta. You, I just want but, pasta. But you have been a specific sort of comedian, that intellectual, smart, the the road that Rock, Chris Rock came up on. We're like, he does politics. Here comes Roy. I'm sure you could do an hour of joke jokes that would slay that have nothing to do with politics. Most Correct. people cannot do the political stuff that you can do. And and thank you for that. So then the question becomes, how do I harness that, but in a way that speaks to how people consume news now? Yeah. Because that's what, to me, that's the biggest change, is that we are to satire the news. But the way people get their news is not as universal as it was when The Daily Show was incepted. Mm -hmm. So that's where I start to question creatively, okay, what's the tweak? 
How do I tweak it and make it affordable? Because I'm about to pay for that shit out of pocket until I can. <laughs> but that's the question. And that also, I love, yo, I love local and state politics too, bro. We don't talk about that enough. We don't focus on it enough. Like we do in the big in the bigger sense of this state is but Alabama's gerrymandering, which could affect the national thing. Or this state is if you even think about abortion, you'll go to jail, which could now become a national law. So like state laws and state the debate about state legislation is often tied to a national conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's still a lot of issues that affect people locally within the state that the national media just don't have the time nor care to cover that would be as interesting of a show as a national news show. Mm. And I think that that intrigues me. But we're just we're entering an era of television where people are going to be Hedging bets hard is a reason why you're getting a shit ton of remakes and reboots. Surely with your name, your stature, folks are calling. Yeah. Networks, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, there's opportunities to do television shows, but we're talking like sitcoms or write a film and shit like that. And that's all great. But that's stuff that can be taken away from me. You want your own thing create something that I'm quarterbacking. You can't take that from me. We can do it together. You mean quarterback and general manager. Correct. Like. And yeah, yeah. So it's less notes. But it's got to be something that speaks to the people because right now, to me, with non-scripted content, it's really no different than a live show. The streets decide who the champ is. Not the network, not the network notes. If you're getting numbers... You win and you will be rewarded. And there's nothing else you can say to me. Whereas what you have to be careful about is maintaining the authenticity of the original product. Um, but you have to create that yourself. That's why I would I would argue that when I talk about like ideation like that and like that, when I talk about the evolution of the late, late night per se, I would argue that Z-Way and Jesus and Mero were probably really good tips of the spear. Eric Andre to a degree, but what Eric does is a little more absurdist and like on the far end of the mm -hmm. scale, which is why it still works now mm -hmm. because it's just so fucking out there. But Z-Way and Jesus and Mero, how are you saying their they shows, changed the game? They, they changed the game in the sense that they created something that was their own and then they moved it over into linear. Yeah. The streets voted them. Z-Way was not created off of some development deal. Right. Z-Way got in her fucking iPhone during a pandemic and was Blew just up. doing that. Yes. But she cooked it herself. Yes. She yes. figured out what the pasta was, made a meal, and then somebody said, hey, come over here and open a restaurant. Same game with Deezus and Mero. Now, once you cross into that, then you're dealing with network notes and production and too many people in the kitchen trying to cook your shit for you. And that can go south. But in terms of the ideation and the evolution, if late night is going to evolve in any kind of way, the solution is going to come from the creators, not the executives, because the executives, in my opinion, up until this point, aren't willing to roll the dice on something that hasn't already been voted on and proven true and approved by the streets. Mm. So any evolution of late Lily Singh, the streets voted for Lily Singh before they gave her that one o'clock slot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure. Amber Ruffin might be the only one that was an internal development situation. I can't speak to what she was doing with the Amber Ruffin show before they put it on Peacock. But, you know, I know Amber was always been doing her thing, writing for Seth Meyers, and I think she was at SNL before that. But in terms of was there a low-budget version of the Amber Ruffin show before it came? But even with Amber's, even with the, with the Amber Ruffin show, she's got like, 15 years of pedigree working within 30 Rock. So, yeah, we'll take a chance on you. We've seen you around. We, like, okay, we'll try your new idea. But for the most part, if we're talking about the evolution of late night, bro. You keep saying you, this this phrase, network notes, with yeah. this disdain. 
and this like then I got <laughs> notes from the network. Like <sighs> for people who don't understand network notes, let me explain it to you in a regular relationship format. Imagine you're in a relationship and you've put on your outfit and you know your outfit is tight. And then your significant other just goes, I don't know if I could do that top. And now you're in your head about that top. But you kind of have to change it, right? Depends on how much you want to be with that network. Right. Because you can go kiss my ass and right. then you wear that top. Right. And then they break up with your ass because right. you're looking crazy. Or you can wear the top and then everybody goes, wow, that's an amazing top. And then your significant other has to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> because you were proven right by the streets. So, yeah, I, it's it's rare that network notes are what you want to hear as a it's, creator, but they, they help in some regard. But usually, Do they ever help? Sometimes, but usually it's just people justifying a paycheck to change something. I mean, there's definitely differences between creators and managers, and I, they can't, managers can't create. I just wish people would just would just be okay with not knowing... And just saying, we don't know. I and heard just, I, that you probably heard this. The first Chappelle show. I was just about to say that. Right, they first were gonna, season. They were. They were going to. They wanted to have that. Uh, the blind Klansman sketch. Yeah. Comedy Central said no, and Dave and Neil said, "Fuck you, we will leave." And yeah. they were like, "Okay, fine." And of course, it killed. And then they had almost no notes yeah. after that because we clearly can't coach this yeah, show. Yeah, the story was like after that first episode aired, they're like, we have no idea what you guys are doing, but just keep doing it. Thanks. Yeah. We'll be quiet now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> Straight chaos. Like, I just think that, like, so then when you ask me what's next, it's like, okay, well, then what's my, what's the thing? What's the creative thing I want to do? Because even if I got Daily Show, you still have to figure out a way to tweak it. How would I tweak it? So it's just a matter of figuring that out. But as I figure that out, because I'm not in a rush to get back in front of a microphone, I'm blessed enough to be able to still tour. I'm blessed enough to be able to sell a TV show or two and let that help me. Because that's stuff that I also want to do. I just I don't want to just be the dude that's yelling about race and politics all the time. Yeah, I don't think I don't think yelling is the word anybody would put in there. Yeah, that's true. I guess I'd just be slick with it. <laughs> Wait, is slip. is is the White House correspondence dinner like a Super Bowl in your world, in your mind? In comedy, yeah. It's one of the so. biggest gigs you could get. I still wonder if crushing at the Oscars gets you more. Mm, definitely more eyeballs. I would I would also argue the Oscars is a more difficult audience. Mm -hmm. Because Hollywood types are more far more pretentious. Politicians are far more likely to laugh, especially laugh at other people too. The the correspondence dinner has become an epic roast. So you're just yeah. like I'm going to diss Fox. I'm going to diss the president. I'm going to diss the Republican Party. I'm going to diss Emerson. You're kind of sitting, because I've been in that room, and you're kind of like, I hope they diss us, because if they don't diss us, they don't care they, about us care. at all. You yeah. got to see something. But then when I diss you, you don't laugh, because you're at the table with your boss, and you're all, <laughs> <laughs> But if you, whatever you're going to say, we know. We know we're vulnerable on this area. <laughs> you're not shocking us. I'd say... Is it is it the Super Bowl? That it's it's hard because it's comedy that is literally of that moment. Yeah, and the way the news cycle works now, you basically three fourths of that performance was written two weeks before. Yeah, because you got to be in the moment. We had all these other jokes that worked fine, but that was two months ago. We had a whole run about Chinese spy balloons at the time. The dinner is in April. The spy balloon shit broke, I think, January, February. By the time we got to April, no one cared. No one remember. And it ended up literally just being a single sentence of a reference. Right. That's all that's all we could do. When did you so, come up with you you opened with Oh, President Biden, you left your classified material here. You don't know what to do with it. You're not careful and 
meticulous. When did was that an was that like early joke or that like last minute? The day before. Yeah. And it was only because at that point the Mike Pence had documents. It was Trump Mar-a-Lago. Right. Let's just say January, February, it was Trump Mar-a-Lago documents. Might have been a little bit before that, but the sequence of document story zeitgeist was Trump. Then it was um, Biden's leaving documents, and then it was revealed that Mike Pence had documents. And the Mike Pence thing is what kept the volleyball and the air of relevance. So we're like, oh, well, what's the fr-? we did We worked the whole set, myself and the writers, and then got to the night before where I ran it. I went to the DC Improv, and I ran the whole set um, the night before just to get a final feel for the cadence of everything. And then literally we were like, oh, shit, what's the first joke going to be? Like you have the first formal joke, but that first sentence – Like, this is, in my opinion, this is Def Jam protocols. You have 10 seconds. They say, they they like to say in late night, like if you're doing a Fallon or a Letterman or whoever set, you want to have like two to three laughs per minute. So you're looking for a laugh every 20 seconds. Oh, I've heard much faster than that. That You've got to make it. Who is it? I think it was... Steve Harvey was like, you got to make them belly laugh every six to seven seconds. Once you're on a roll, yeah, you know who does that really well is Earthquake now. <sighs> Earthquake can have you in seizures for nine consecutive minutes, and it's just tag after tag and escalate and escalate and escalate. Yo, Che, Michael Che will murder you. Yeah. Like, I thought my body was going to be, like, hurt. Like, I'm in physical pain. <laughs> Because yeah. I'm laughing so hard. I went to see Earthquake. Um, I was with Tom Joyner in Dallas. We were on his HBCU baseball classic. And we just said, yeah, let's go see Earthquake tonight. Killing him. Murdering him. Killing him. Like there's the, – the idea was three sentences or less. I need to get the first laugh. What's the joke? You don't need a setup. You just need a joke. And that's we we figured, all right, at rehearsal, let's plant a piece of paper in the podium. So then on that night, I can just hand it back to Biden. <laughs> you left this. Hey, man, you left some of your documents up here. How y'all doing tonight? And just, if it doesn't get a laugh, plow through. But it got a laugh. And that's before I've even introduced myself. And to me, that was important because also, psychologically speaking, I feel like President's the most powerful person in the yard. I got to punch you first. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You, you could do it. There's a million ways to do it, and the set probably would have stood. The, the, the other jokes would have probably worked fine. But to really establish, oh, shit, what is this guy going to do? I have to juggle dynamite. I, I and like- that sucks because that's a joke you can't run. You can't practice giving the president back his documents <laughs> no, at the no, DC no. Improv the night before. But I love when comics come out and hit me with a joke right away rather than, hi, so nice for you to be here. Oh, my God. And then have ease a choice. into it. I didn't have a choice. They don't know me. This is easily, I want to say career suicide, but if for sure – move you back a couple of places. It's like in Sorry, where you have to go back to home and start your journey over again around That's the board. That's a parent metaphor. <laughs> adults are like, Sorry. oh yeah, I remember the game. Sorry, yeah. Man, this year when I was seven. Yeah, Monopoly, what, go to jail. What's your, what's, what is your favorite joke from that White House Correspondents Dinner set? Clarence Thomas. <laughs> was it in black Clarence people? Thomas are okay with the erasure of black history as long as we're erasing Clarence Thomas? <laughs> no, it was the tag after that. Clarence Thomas is owned by, we can all see Clarence Thomas, but he's owned by billionaire Harlan Crow. We can see him, but he's owned by somebody else. And that's what an NFT is. And <laughs> calling Clarence Thomas an NFT, just 
It tickled me so much. And my only regret is that we didn't set that joke up properly earlier in the set with a what is an NFT. Right. Like if we'd have done that in like the first 15, it was a 20-minute set. If somewhere in the first five minutes I go da 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 da, and what is an NFT? Y'all just come up with new ways to hide money. Nobody knows what an NFT is. Continue joke 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 joke. Then get to Clarence Thomas. We can see Clarence Thomas, but he belongs to Harlan Crow, and that's what an <laughs> NFT is. <laughs> that would have been like ah, like it's like it's like your toe is on the line for a three pointer. Mm, it's like ah, mm. fuck, I missed. We missed a place to set it up. But the Clarence Thomas shit broke a week and a half before the dinner. Yeah, yeah. The, the Harlan Crow stuff. That that stuff, can't, it was, the corruption talk was already happening. But the meat of what the joke was about happened so close, we just didn't have time. I just, you just run out of time. You, you're never done. The writers were in a group WhatsApp chat. We're texting as the event is happening. Yeah. Tags. We're changing jokes. Biden is up there stepping on fucking jokes, bro. Biden's crushing, and he's calling himself old. He made a Putin or Ukraine-Russia reference. And y'all are writing as he's talking. They're texting me while I'm sitting up there. Is it in prompter? It, it's in prompter, but now I just got to go blow, I gotta blow past it because the prompter operator doesn't know that we're making these changes, which is why you keep the cards. That was the one thing Conan O'Brien told me that I'm— said, go up there with cards, don't trust the prompter. Because somebody else is operating the prompter. And, you know, prompters can sometimes go out. For sure. If you have a hater on the other end. Like, you just, you don't know. It could happen. I didn't meet the prompter, op prompter operator. So anybody could have sabotaged that whole fucking set. But if you, if you go out of order and he or she gets confused as to, like, well, where are we now in the script? You got to be able to figure out. This is where I know where I'm going. I don't need you. Correct. But that's also why we rehearse. So you just merge back in the traffic, read the script ahead, and just bring it up. So you, you, your political comedy serves a really important part of society because the world is super depressing right now. And it's kind of scary. And we might get Trump as president again. Yes. And nobody is looking forward to another One four years of team. Biden either um do you feel scared about the future of the country no do i think it could go bad yeah but am i scared of it no once you've like seen like the bowels of the country and as bad as things have been in the past it's more of a lack of, it's more feeling like resigned to it than fear. You're numb. Yeah. You just, you, I mean, especially if you black, the like country you, been you, through you and seen grew up in that you probably thought, okay, this is pretty good. It could be better, but it's pretty good. Yeah. Now, like, I mean, Trump, Roe v. Wade, the economy, a lot of things are happening. It's like, damn, this is very, I, I feel yeah, scared. I think it's definitely has the potential to be very cataclysmic. But the question to me is, how does that change my job? My job is to go out and figure out a way to make some of that shit funny. That's my contribution. This is your boy's world, though, right? That's, your son's okay. world. So you then, this world. then if there's a way with humor to inspire people, then cool, then I've done my job. But I can't be arrogant enough to think that this is the joke that will change everything. No, but of course. This idea that you can try and do what you can to make a difference in the ways that best work for you. You know, I was, um, <coughs> excuse me. I was at the Route 100 event, um, this year, and they were in you know, honor. I was hosting, you know, honoring, you know, all these black people who've done this, that, and the third, and all these different fields. And they had Kareem Jean Pierre was one, and Al Roker was another one of the honorees. And and I just said jokingly on stage, I was like, 
Kareen is easily one of the most stressed out black people, like, and we see it every day on TV. Like, she's the one black person who every day just just stressed in the face, just always got to deal with something. And Al Roker is hands down the happiest black person <laughs> that we also get to see every single day. Just happy, just a ball of happiness. And, and there's something to take from both of them in that watching Al in the morning can really help you feel a little better or brighter about your day and give you a little bit of go get them you might need to push through whatever the fuck it is, whatever trauma whatever you're, you're dealing, dealing with, with, whatever you're dealing with that day, where Kareen could be also the person that when you feel like the way she, her facial expressions are sometimes. That question is so dumb. Oh, my God. You know you're not alone. Mm, interesting. So they both serve a purpose in terms of inspiration by mm. just existing and doing what they do the way they do it. Mm -hmm. Both people matter. For sure. So, you know, am wait, I am so I wait. afraid? Yeah. But it doesn't change the job. So wait, if KJP is on one end of the spectrum and Al, Al Roker's at the, the other end, where are you in that on that spectrum? Um, I scale closer to Corinne Jean Pierre. Really, um, you know, you know my comedy, my stand up for the most part is very straight faced. I'm not, I don't smile a lot. You know, but you're I helping us of, to laugh at the craziness. Correct. So I have to know about the craziness. I have to consume the craziness. The thing I've enjoyed the most about about being away from the Daily Show. I miss, I miss, God damn, I miss Ronnie Chang. I, mm. I miss everybody, but Ronnie was my old office mate. But I do not envy having to consume national news anymore. I consume national, I watch the local news now because I don't, because I don't have to know the larger in-depth layered conversation not because I'm not making a joke about this on TV this week. So I don't need to know the third and fourth layer of the issue yeah. to make the most unique joke. Right now, I just need to know what's going on. And local news really does take what's happening and boil it down. They, I joke they only got 30 minutes because Wheel of Fortune's got to come on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not digesting something horrific for 30 minutes straight and then a pundit debate. And then in hour number two, we'll talk about other stuff. Give me all the sadness in 90-second intervals. Give me weather. Give me sports. Give me a feel-good story. And, like, that's done so much for my psyche. So this level of optimism that that where things are doesn't always have to be. I still hold a little bit of that. So I'm not completely stressed like she is because if I am, then I'm going to lose my edge mm. To be funny, you still have to pop back over to Al Ro to the Al Roker side of the scale mm. to kind of be like, all right, we can kind of tongue in cheek, you know, smile at it, but we don't have to like really. I'm not going to be, you know, in. I can't. I choose not to be oblivious to that, and it's and it's an important thing because. Let's not get it twisted. Al Roker isn't necessarily on TV smiling because he's ignoring stuff and his head is in the sand. He just understands that that's what he wants to do that helps to contribute to the betterment and unification of shit. What are, so, one of the things that shocked me in 2016, a lot of funny people and some entertainment people were like, I'm fine with Trump because it's good for comedy. That will be fun and funny and easy to joke about and good for us. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but like, what if the country is going like off the deep end? Cause the guy's a moron and he's corrupt and all these other things. And yeah. not saying you, cause we didn't talk about this, but like comics, a lot of comics were like, that is not important to me. What is important to me is comedy. And this is grist for the comedy mill. Yeah. yeah I mean, he's misery, setting the country on fire. Yeah. Yo. I mean, misery is good for comedy though. Cause that's where, if everybody's in pain, then there's something for us to all unify under and laugh at. I get what they're saying, but, you know, comedians are cynical, and we almost don't even consider ourselves citizens. 
in a way. Like we don't, we're journalists. Like comedy is a form of journalism to me. Okay. So you're either reporting on yourself as a human being or you're reporting on the world you see. But either way, journalistically, you view yourself as not part of the populace. Most comics. There's comics that are extremely right, and there's comics that are extremely left. So, of course, that's not always the case. But I think that most comics also, during the early days of Trump, didn't think that shit was going to go as wild as it went. Mm. Now, there's a lot of shit there to talk about that was good for comedy. But to say it's good for comedy means that you're kind of disconnected from the real world consequences that are attached to the things that you're joking about. I can't exist in that place. I know a lot of comedians that can, but they also don't vote. They, they also, they, they don't care. It's interesting, this notion of, we are, we are a little different. We are not citizens. We are only thinking about how this affects comedy, even if that yeah. means sort of what, erasing myself. Like, can, right, I'm thinking about just getting the laughs. Correct. I'm just here to get the laugh. I don't know why y'all tripping about what I can and can't say. It was a joke. I was here just to make the joke. Y'all are stressing over something that I don't care about. And you're not going to see many comedians, you know, care about that. I, know a lot, I've, I have heard that a lot of comedians are depressed. And the comedy is in relation to themselves. And I've known comedians who are like, I will choose to do things in my life that will make me more depressed because that will help my comedy. But, but are, that. Are, are you, are you, is that like you? That. Are you, are you depressed? Is I'm that not, part of it? I'm not self-destructive like that. You know, comedy, comedy for sure helped me with depression. You know, I'm not going to talk about mental illness in the sense that I'm like, oh, I go see this, that, and the third psychiatrist and I'm taking all the pills. I'm not. I'm blessed enough to not be that far into the water. But when I started, when I was 19, absolutely, I was dealing with all types of fucking just issues with depression. And stand-up became an outlet for just getting my thoughts out. So for the most part, if I'm performing or I have something to look forward to, I'm straight. And I have been since 98. So I'm blessed in that regard. But I know a lot of cats dealing with a lot of shit. And also, comedy is very, it's an isolationist living, mm. if you allow it to be. So if you don't have a lot of friends, it's not a job that lends to meeting a lot of people, especially if you're on the road all the time. All you got is the one or two people that you travel with. And so you may have your own set of demons. And now you're alone in a hotel room for a weekend in Vegas or Chicago or somewhere. Some and paper. Now, and now you can really get into some mischief. And so that can be a bad thing. I've opened and worked with a lot of comedians that are no longer here because of suicide. And I can look back at certain mile markers over the arc of our friendship and you can see the the, the degradation mm. of their of their emotional state. And it comes out in small pieces here and there, but I think if you pay attention to most comedians, you can see that most comedians are either performing to run towards a truth mm -hmm. that they're trying to unpack, or they're running from a truth that mm -hmm. they don't want to face. You're running to the truth? Yeah. That's the evolution of it. You know, like I want to get into... It'll be after this next special, but I, I'm I'm getting into talking about my father and a relationship with my father as it informs my relationship with my son. Mm, yes. You know, I, so I went on finding your roots, and that 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 did a number on me, bro. Because you know I, my pops died when I was 16, and you know you can have a great father, but they still not be the best husband, right? So. I go on Finding Your Roots, and I find out that my dad lost his dad when he was four. Wow. Did not know that. Wow. And after that, based on the census reports and all of that, there was never another male head of household in my father's life living with his, with his mom. There was wow. never another, a man in the house again wow. after that. 
So, you know, my father, as far as I knew, grew up without a father figure that was solid in the house on a regular basis. I don't know what the community in Chicago afforded him, but having that male North Star at the crib, he didn't have that. So it completely reconstituted everything that I felt and thought about. It's like you mad at somebody for not doing the job the way you thought they should have done it, and then just imagine one day you find out they never got the training. Right, right. So how mad can you be at them now still I mean, for not doing the job? My dad didn't have his dad at all, and my mother, and he was a great father, and my mother every once in a while would be like, I'm so impressed at the father he is able to be, having had no mentor, no model of what that's supposed to look like. Yeah, it's all, you almost become the worst example or you become what you wish you had mm -hmm. as far as parenting goes. So for me, a lot of it is trying to be what I wish I had, but then you also have to unpack yourself. So you have to run to that truth because if I'm going to help my son prepare and deal with the world, he needs to know what may, hey, man, here's what emotional issue software may already be pre-installed on you. Sorry about that. Here's how to work through that. Here's how to challenge yourself. Here's how to stay calm. Like stuff like that. I need my job is to give him the tools to be able to deal with himself as well as the world. But you can only do that adequately as a father if you run to who you are. So you got to unpack that. And of course, as you unpack stuff like that, you're like, all right, I got to talk about this shit on stage. But that's going to take a lot. Like, that's a 2025, 20, 26 ordeal. But I, for now, we'll go on stage and say Joe Biden got German shepherds. Black people shouldn't vote for him. <laughs> But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but we're gonna go mining deep after that. But on the other side of that, it's time to get busy. Wait, uh, so you're with your son, seven years old? Correct. What's his name? Henry. My son's Hendrix, which okay. is a cousin name, Henry <laughs> Hendrix. Um your relationship has changed. Correct. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in a co parenting situation now. So yeah, so So, so how has your fathering changed, right? Like how you feel like you need to show up for him. More intentional. More intentional. When I'm around you, I'm on you. I'm in the house, like all of that. We just in the house together and I get to you when I get to you type stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't have that luxury anymore when you're not under the same roof 24-7. Mm -hmm. So now it's, okay, I get home at this time. Like right now, when this podcast ends... I know I have about 30 minutes to myself when I get home. So we'll knock out the most important emails, one or two phone calls. He'll hit the door. And from that time till bedtime, it's all about him. Right down to, to what we're going to talk about. I'm thinking about that. Really? You know, the other thing I've learned, <coughs> the other thing I've learned that's cool, and I don't know if this works for other parents or would work for other parents, but... I like to share with my son when I'm having a bad day. Oh. And he'll ask questions, and then that creates a system of, hey, when I'm feeling like this, I deal like this. Because, you know, kids see you as perfect and feel like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Then they're less, I think they're less likely to come to you when they're having their thing or asking that question. Our fathers, I don't know about your father, but a, a most, I think, of the men of our generation were like, I don't have problems. I'm not vulnerable. I'm yeah. strong. My father, I, I, it, I, I didn't even know if he ever cried or if he ever got upset <laughs> or if he ever got depressed. And when his mother died, I was like, he's not going to cry in front of me, right? And my mother's like, no, he's not going to. So I'm policing him. Don't, don't, sh I don't want to see your sadness of the death of your mom. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, I think our generation has been more intentional about I'm sad. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. And the kids love it when we say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake and show the fallibility. <coughs> 
somebody told me, somebody told me one time, one question to ask your child every, every so often is, what's one thing I do that you love? And what's one thing I do that you hate? And ask <laughs> it on a sunny day. You can't do that with teenagers, but seven, you can still do that. Yeah, but teenagers will will take your guts and rip them out. That okay, that's fine. It's still feedback, and it's because this idea of do as I say and shut up, and no, that's no. an order, sir. Yes, sir. No, no. That's militaristic. It's also, if we want to be one hundred about it, some of it is still residual slavery. For sure, master. Subjugation, is that the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much I buy into that ideology, but this idea of, wow, I didn't know I made you feel like that when I did that, so let me scale it back. Da, da, da. You know, like, okay, I won't. Yelling scares you or something. Okay, well, then when I'm mad about other things, I will go to another room and I will calm down like to show you. That's how you do it. Yeah. And I was in the middle of drilling some shit at the house. And I'm I'm already mad because the dude didn't put the TV. My TV's crooked on the wall. Okay. So I'm trying to like, and it's just a quarter inch adjustment that I have to make to this television. And when I tell you, this has been a three-week ordeal <laughs> with multiple trips to Home Depot and trying to reset a TV, an in-wall TV mount. And get the anchor screws out. The, whatever it was, something happened. I just went, ah, like, just a visceral. And it was just frustration. I was legit frustrated. And I had to go. I had to go sit and cool. Work on my breathing. And let him see. It, you know what I mean? So that it's not, you need to know I'm holding myself to the same standards that I'm trying to hold you, bro. Um but it's it's just when when I'm with my son, it's more it's more intentional, and I'm still unpacking like a lot of what to do about his perception of what I do, mm -hmm. and getting him to understand that a little bit. I took him with me to the Daily Show when I cleaned out my office. Okay, with that understanding that so he would know this is I don't work here anymore. Mm. You know, because you know this is where I work. He knows that much about me. So I feel like he should know this too. And it's one of those moments that I hope he remembers and I hope he can I hope he can understand what happened. what 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 happened. Yeah. And so that he'll understand that you can have something that's good, but it's it's not permanent. None of it's permanent. So that's one of them plant the seed now. Hopefully he gets it, you know, down the road type of things. Mm -hmm. But trying to be more intentional about who I am to him. You know, like like your parents are your parents, right? And they're like these these fucking drill sergeants and they just yell shit at you to do and not do. And every and periodically they reward you with Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> or a cupcake or a trip to some wherever the fuck. But you don't know them. You don't even know who they are as mm. people. So Especially dad. Mom will kind of Yeah, but, it's if you're lucky your dad lives long enough for y'all to have a beer together while you're fixing a fucking deck. Mm. And then you can go to tell me, Pop, what was it like when you was fourteen? And then your dad will finally tell you something emotional. I'm trying to do that now. Yeah. In chunks based on where he is intellectually yeah. as well. Yeah. Here's the things I like. Here's the thing. You know what I enjoy, man? I like doing this. Now, I like doing it this way. What's your favorite color? Oh, my favorite color is purple. Okay, you like purple? I got this LED clock in my room with a little ambient light joint on the top. And you can change the, the RGB and change the color of the light. He'll come in there some nights and just change the light to his color and we'll read. And then when he gets up to go to his room to go to bed, he'll change it back to purple because he knows like, you know what I mean? Like, and I never even had to ask him. He just did it. So he knows I like baseball. He don't really like baseball. He'll watch it with me. 
You don't really like baseball. I ain't going to force them. But you know I like the Cubs. You know, like just base level things. I like purple. I like hot dogs. I like the Cubs. I used to work over here. I don't work here anymore. And it's, in theory, should eventually tell a story to him about who I was. Because eventually I'm not going to be around to tell the rest of the story. Right. So I'm trying to pre-install the software. <laughs> and that's the shit you can't get training on. And there's no fucking Dr. Spock book no. to help you with that. There's plenty of black podcasts about relationships. Ain't none after you didn't had the kid again <laughs> co-parenting. Where's that fucking drink champs <laughs> episode? <laughs> <laughs> Should you be taking woman on two hundred dollar dates to Cheesecake Factory? Fuck you! What do I do when I'm trying to figure out how to discipline him, but his mom's on a flight, and I'm trying to co-parent, but the discipline need to happen fast. But I don't want to do nothing until we talk as a team, because we agree to parent as a team. So in the meantime, he's just sitting in the corner, waiting on her flight. To, what do I do? Where's that podcast? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when you're waiting to to be a team and talk to your child about something, but one of y'all is on stage? <laughs> I think uh, I see your next move. <laughs> there you go. The co-parenting podcast? There you go. The co-parenting show. That shit will get five listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you so much to Roy for a great interview, and thanks to you for listening. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality. Maybe this show can help. You can find me on Instagram at Torre Show. Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our engineer is Claire McHale. And our booker is Claudia Jean. And we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back on Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down.